Welcome to the Dawn Jarvis Show podcast, where we talk to busy leaders and professionals and business owners about who they are, what they do, and why they do it. We also talk about how they stay focused, positive, and productive, and how, as very busy people, they maintain their own health and well being. Today's guest is my friend Deanne Graham, and we are going to talk about autoimmune hair loss. And we're going to learn about how community is one of the most important pieces when experienced a diagnosis of alopecia, about what resources are available to help at this very difficult time and that and to find out that everybody will have an opinion on what you should do but to move forward it's important to find the confidence and do things your own way. Um, I met Diane on a course, an online course, Heroic Online Courses um, by Pat Flynn and we went on to be members of a, a mastermind together Deanne Graham is an award-winning author, alopecia coach, consultant, educator and advocate. She was diagnosed with alopecia areata at seven years old. She published Heads On Stories of Alopecia to share stories and photos of people around the world living with alopecia in order to provide a broad perspective on the journey of hair loss. Deanne is also the host of Alopecia Life podcast and a course creator where she continues to educate and share stories to help others realise they are not alone. Hello Deanne, it's lovely to see you. Hi, Don. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to be here. Thank, oh, thank you. Well, thank you to you for coming on a really interesting topic. It's so good to see you and I'm looking forward to our chat. Um, the first question in your in your bio, um, I found out that you, you know, you were diagnosed with alopecia at seven years old and, and uh, we were talking before and, you know, as a children's nurse, you worked with people with a hereditary disease and um, having a son who was diagnosed with diabetes at 22, I, I realised that diagnosis and age, particularly with children and young people, can be quite you know, uh, difficult and uh, different I think is what I wanted to get out I wanted to talk to you about both your diagnosis as, at age seven but also how you got to where you are to do to do the work that you're doing with hair loss yeah so there's a lot to unpack there a, a lot because when yeah. you're diagnosed you're diagnosed as a child and you think you know this is the way that things are. And so you look to uh -huh. your parents or other adults in your life for guidance. And, you know, that could be from saying, you know, this is how you handle this. This is how you present yourself to the world. And, and that is kind of where I was in a lot of the time it, it was not talking about it back then. You didn't talk about your feelings or things that were going on. You just kind of moved through it. You powered through and, and you dealt with it. And so that's, how I, I did it, you know, you, you can look at it as, you know, being really strong and pushing through and persevering, but it was really challenging to not really know, have an understanding of what alopecia areata really was in autoimmune disease, never even entered the picture, the term autoimmunity never entered until I was way older, an older adult, in fact. Okay, and that that must have been yeah. And when and when did you when did you start feeling different? Was it as a teenager? As it was a, was it as a young adult? Or um, actually, when? I I was a child who felt different for forever. I mean, when I was two years yeah. old is when I was first diagnosed with type one diabetes, and oh, right. that life, as as you now know, right, is very. Uh -huh challenging. Um, your son uh -huh. was 20, you know, 22. Okay. I, I yeah. was actually two years old when I was diagnosed. And so my life was, you're different already. You have, you're getting insulin injections, um, once a day at the time, you know, it was like, that's all they would say. Okay. You just have this once a day and you have to manage your, your life around this one dose plus snacks. And then you would go to school and you'd be eating a snack during recess. And it would just be you know, how much more do you need to be told you're different when kids are playing on the playground and you're, you know, hiding a snack in the pocket of your sweater. So, yeah, I mean, it's just so, so feeling different wasn't an un uncommon thing for me or an unknown thing to me. It was very familiar. And so the added diagnosis of alopecia areata and being bald was um, just kind of a topper. <laughs> oh. 
and I, I can't imagine what what that would be like actually to be going to school to have you know as I, I'm guessing quite dramatic hair loss and having to cope with that as well as a long-term condition how how did you cope with it well, I didn't. I mean, I think that coping yeah. is something that is a common day term now, Yeah. but uh, coping and then thriving, right? I mean, those are two yeah. things that you didn't do. You just, I mean, I lived and I, you know, I played sports. I had friends, I had a family mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they were all really loving and wonderful, but I did extracurriculars. You know, I was in Girl Scouts and I playing those sports really did bring me out of my shell. Cause a lot of the time you, it, it's tempting to isolate yourself at home. Right. And just say, I don't want to see people. I don't want anyone to see me. Um, and that was just a really big deal for me to go out and, and play sports. And, and so yeah. I did that. You raise an interesting point there around the word coping, you know, you know, and, and why would we expect a child to cope? What, you know, what does coping mean? Mm-hmm. And I suppose as an adult, it's around managing, it's around finding a way to live, you know, and I think um, with long-term conditions, you know, I have experiences with my son and, you know, um, that you, you, you find a way of managing and knowing what you what you're capable of but I think as a child um it's not fair it's just that you know and especially when you're seeing other people and as you say knowing that you're different and um so very challenging I would have thought and I I I like the fact that you you played sports and you and you didn't stay at home but nobody would have blamed you if you had if you know that Mm -hmm. would be totally understandable and have that you know as well as as hair loss and sort of like going out and facing the world and you know this is me um you know it is you know additionally um commendable but I, I'm sure that you don't want to be seen as you know, brave or anything like that because mm-hmm. I mean, that's quite patronizing but because that's your life isn't it really and oh, that really. and that is um it, that is that is your life and you've you've managed to channel um sort of you know living this life with sort of like doing a lot of work around um alopecia and hair loss and you know um I, I sort of wanted for our and I because I know that this affects quite a lot of people um and, and at different ages and different causes and different causes you've talked about autoimmune as a being a cause of of hair loss and I think people sometimes people don't know what alopecia is you know what what it's caused by and I just wanted to talk a little bit about that so for people People who might not know you know mm-hmm. hair loss we can set we can we can picture that we can see what that means but an alopecia that's a quite a technical term that people might not know what it means so I wondered if you could help us with that you bet so mm-hmm. alopecia areata is considered an autoimmune condition and a lot of people who live with alopecia prefer to call it a condition instead of a de- a disease mm-hmm. and it's it, it's kind of softer, I guess, when you think about it, you know, you don't go, it's a disease. And even though our bodies are really confused, it's not unlike any other autoimmune condition, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, type Mm -hmm. one diabetes is autoimmune, Um, lupus, Crohn's disease, all of these are our bodies being confused and attacking the, in, in this case, the hair follicles, and they are for the most part active still, and they can have, you can have spontaneous regrowth at any time in your life, even after the extreme of alopecia universalis i've seen it before so yeah yeah that's really good to know and also good to know there's different types you know it's not always um irreversible you know and there's different ways of um of coping um with that so there you talk about community being very important when you experience that diagnosis Uh, and i think community is um is really important anyway Mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting around the world because we talked about is it condition is it a disease and i'm a nurse and come from a medical model but you are right when you're talking about any long-term condition it's but it's better to talk about as a way of life rather than it and the word disease makes it very medically modeled doesn't it Mm -hmm. It and and so does and so does diagnosis as well but if i i suppose there's something around having a diagnosis that makes you it's a thing and it's not you know something that you know that you that's it's a stress thing or it's or something else so so I think the word diagnosis is important and as I said you talk about community being really really important so tell me a little bit about how that's helped you and how that can help others 
Absolutely. If actually, if we could take like one step back, I should have added a little bit about the the term or the diagnosis of alopecia areata, because it is the blanket term for all forms of autoimmune hair loss. And so Uh alopecia areata is really, you know, when you look at it, it it talks about area areata. Um, So it's spots, round spots, typically, sometimes you can have diffuse hair loss, Um, but then it can progress to alopecia totalis, which is complete scalp loss. And you might keep your eyelashes, eyebrows, your nose hair, your hair, and then it may progress to alopecia universalis, which is what I have. And that's head to toe hair loss. And so when you hear alopecia areata medically in, in the medical office, they will just call it alopecia areata, no matter if you look like me or you have patchy hair loss. So it's kind of common to just hear alopecia kind of thrown out like that. And there are different types of alopecia too. There's scarring alopecia and androgenic alopecia, but what I kind of focus on is autoimmune alopecia. And yeah, let's go back. Let's go back to that community question, the importance of it. And like you said, it's community is important for everything, right? I mean, when you find your people, when you know that there's someone who understands it makes a world of difference. And for me personally, I did not meet anybody for like 30 years who had alopecia. I mean, nobody looked like me on television. Nobody looked like me in my neighborhood. And I lived in a pretty um, busy part of Southern California. It was, you know, houses were row houses, you know, next door. And, and I lived in the suburbs and went to school in really populated cities. So um, not seeing anyone is, it's not because they didn't exist The the percentage, the 2% of the population is, has been consistent throughout time from, from the time I've had it till now. And those numbers are, are pretty significant. So the fact that people are covering it with a wig or a scarf or, or they're having just spontaneous regrowth, right? They're getting one spot and it's growing back. So they, they no longer have like the visible signs of alopecia that it kind of throws you off a little bit, especially as a child thinking, wow, I truly am alone. And, and recognizing that now that I'm an adult is, is kind of, I remember feeling very sad about it as an adult yeah. thinking, wow, I wish I would have known because it is very lonely feeling for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, what types of communities are there? I mean, we're in this online world at the moment, but mm-hmm. there are different types of communities, aren't there? You know, mm-hmm. I, I remember before, um, before Facebook existed, because I was around before Facebook existed, um, viewers <laughs> and listeners, um, <laughs> people used to have email groups. So I was in email, like Yahoo groups, you know, that, you know, people did all sorts of different things, even if they couldn't be together in person, but obviously there's, there's in person and there's all different kinds of ways, isn't there? So tell us a bit about that, Deanne. Yeah. And I think back then there was one nonprofit organization Mm -hmm. that is still around and that's the National Alopecia Areata Foundation, NAF. And that was around, but I didn't know about it until I was an adult. Um, And they, they focus a lot on research, but they have camp or they have, I guess, a conference every year. And that is really a positive impact. That's where I first met folks who were living with hair loss. And that was that was, that made a huge difference for me. And I know that, that, I mean, people say life-changing when they go to these events, you know, they go, oh my gosh, these people are here for me, my people. Um, And then the next thing, and the most, one of the, the groups that I work with and kind of it's really close to my heart is the children's alopecia project and that's cap. And they have camps every year. And I've actually, there's, there's a camp almost every month, the next 11 months, there will be a camp once a month throughout the States. And those are incredible. If you've ever attended a camp for where it's focused on the yes. condition or disease, I mean, yes. you know, the difference that it can make yeah. and you see the light that shines yeah. in their eyes and you just mm-hmm. go, wow, this can yeah. make such a difference. And it does. I mean, kids walk away feeling more confident, knowing that they're not alone and they can then go back home and just kind of communicate that with their, you know, their classmates or their teammates or anything like that. And, and it really does take, it's kind of a letdown. I remember thinking 
after my first conference, I was like, yay, look at all these people. It's wonderful. And then you go home, right? And you think, oh my gosh, wow, what a total bummer, you know, to be home with, with like normal people, quote unquote. And, yeah. and so it's like, you have to continue to communicate with people. And so I always recommend when people leave in-person conferences or camps to keep up communicating, you know, reach out, have a phone call, have a Zoom call try to meet people within your local community to get together with. And I know with COVID and things like that, I think that's been more challenging, but uh, the importance of it is just so crucial. Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think you can have the high of, um, of, of being away, being with your people. And then, then um, if you, and I think the challenges, and this is a little bit, uh, I talk about networking sometimes in that the challenges is how you're going to use that you know the people you've met to sort of like support you going forward I really like um the idea of a conference I also really like the idea of uh, you know, charities that are available and I've, I've had asked people with different conditions or do you know of any um, charities or non-profits that sort of work with that particular thing and sort of and it, it does depend what you want to get out of it and what that mm -hmm. charity does but they are they are there with a bit of research and signposting and um, you can get there and um, I used to go away on a holiday vacation with children with cystic fibrosis and you're absolutely right mm -hmm. it is it is it is life-changing and quite humbling to do that so to see those children together and doing you know we used to go abseiling I didn't do any abseiling because I was too yeah. scared but you know <laughs> they do a bit of canoeing abseiling or whatever together to do those things that they might not have had the courage to do um mm -hmm. in their normal situation so that no, that's lovely and so um, um, you talk up you also talk about the resources that are available to help and know that you've designed some of those resources that are, as well so yeah. you know what are resources that are available to help so you know you know we we have the internet which is you know vast and and stuff like that but I think with community and, and like-minded people it might be easier to mm -hmm. find those resources and for them to be more useful yes and I think the the big thing are books and children when the thing that I found when I went to this first conference was I knew I wanted to write a book and talk about it but I knew that my story was just a tiny piece of it right and I started to meet all of these amazing people and I thought well why not tell their stories why not help them share their stories to give that broader perspective um, on hair loss throughout the world and see the varying degrees varying responses to it and so it was really important for me to have photos and stories because Growing up, I never, ever saw anybody who had alopecia. And anytime you saw someone who was with bald was, you know, they were a villain on TV or, wow. and they were men for the most part. And, yeah. you know, as I got older, the, the reference when people would say, oh, Britney Spears went, you know, a little crazy and she shaved her head off. And, and so oh, the wow. reference of that is always kind of interesting and always yeah. makes us feel like a little bit frustrated by that or you know women who shave their head too like Sinead O'Connor back in the day that was the thing yes. it's like well it's different when you choose to shave your head versus Absolutely. having this right mm -hmm. and so so there were a couple of things like that and I thought if there's nothing out there for people who are recently being diagnosed and this was I mean there were 20, there was probably 24, 26 years between the time I had been diagnosed to the time that I wanted to put my book out, there had been nothing like this out there. And I thought if I could benefit, I would have benefited from it. And so you kind of selfishly yeah. do something that would help yourself back yes, then absolutely. that you realize. Yeah. So, so helping others, I didn't actually realize how big a project it would become and what it would and I, I want to just say to all the story contributors, I reached out to people and there were very few people who said no, or that they weren't ready, or they didn't know how to share, but they, I had photographers who donated their, their experience and just said, yes, you know, I want to be part of this project. And so I was able to do it on pennies and, you know, that's kind of unheard of people always kind of want to return on what they're giving you. And I, I fully appreciated what they were giving. And I, I asked them and gave them photo credit and continue to update yeah. them on how the book's doing and the kind of response that I'm getting. So, and I just, I just had such a phenomenal response from people. What's your book called, um, Vianne? 
It's called Head On Stories of Alopecia. And it's available on Amazon, isn't it? And there will be links to those it, to your book in the show notes. And yeah. you you also talked to me about sort of the children's books that might have been useful um, when you when you, when you were a child that you would yeah. you would recommend. Yeah, and all of these books are available on Amazon. And they, I mean, books like Where's Your Hair, Hannah, My Hair Went on Vacation. Francie puts on her courage and what silly hair day with no hair, anything that features a child with alopecia, whether they're, it's the focus of the book or whether it's kind of unrelated, like the crazy hair day book um, with the silly hair day, it, it just brings attention to something that maybe isn't thought about before, or it educates in a way where a parent can give give the book to the classroom, kind of donate it and say, okay, let's have the kids just pick it off the shelf and look at it and get familiar with alopecia without actually having to talk about it. They can just look at pictures or read the story. And a lot of kids don't read, you know, when, when they're young and these kids are coming in for the first time into uh, pre-K or kindergarten, they, they're just into in looking at the pictures. So, so there's lots of educational resources from books that are helpful and that were never available to me growing up. And, and so I try to expand on that on, on my website, when I talk about resources, it's like, here's this, here's that. And, and just try to give everything, everybody what they need. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's amazing. So um, I, I, I love books. I'm surrounded by books. Um, I, I love them. Sometimes I buy them and don't read them. Sometimes <laughs> I love the, um, the just um, because I like the subject and want to learn about it. I love books with pictures in it because I think that's more expressive. I'm a very visual person. And I think, I don't know if it's because I'm pre-internet, um, but I think the power of books to have a conversation about you know so that's what I love about books you can have a conversation about a book you know even sort of like what the themes of the books are or you know with adults but children will just pick up a book and they will just enjoy it for its sake and will learn by osmosis mm -hmm. um, around it it's a real educational opportunity yes. so I love that and the other resources so you've got a website and again we'll put the links to that but um you do a podcast so there's much more out there mm -hmm. I know um because a lot of black women suffer from hair loss and we wear a lot of wigs and stuff to cover the hair loss but I know mm -hmm. uh, particularly around menopause time and the things that there's a lot of of hair loss and so there's much more out there about it much more community groups much more you know things that I podcast that you do and mm -hmm. you know other things around it so there are there is a lot of resources and what would you recommend um for someone who might be newly diagnosed or this might be a new problem for them that they should do, what resources should, should they access or look for? Yes. And so even putting, going onto Amazon and putting alopecia books is just a great way to get familiar with what's available out there. And then of course, come over to my website and I try to have all um, sorts of resources there, right? Because I know that people learn in different ways, right? There's, like you said, reading is is what appeals to you and touching a book. And But sometimes people want to just have a digital copy of that. And if you can listen and that that's better for you as a learning tool, then listen to podcasts and also seek out these mentors who are living their lives, wanting to mentor these young kids saying, you know, your experience doesn't have to be the way that mine was, if it was a, a negative one, or it can be just as good as mine was, if it was a positive one. And I think that that makes a world of difference. You know, you've got these celebrities who are living with this, Anthony Kerrigan. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with who he is, but no, tell me, tell me who yeah, he is. So, so he is, you know, he's an actor and he's been on um, a lot of different movies and he's played a villain. He was on Gotham and, you know, just plays kind of these villainous type characters and, and he loves it, but he's just played some more, you know, common guy type characters recently. And that's been really exciting for us in the alopecia community because it's always, we don't always want to be seen as villains, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and he's kind of one of the most amazing people and he's in my book too. So that's that, you know, I'm always about talking about him because he's just been so generous with his time with the kids and with me for the book. And he's been interviewed on the podcast, but also when kids see 
people like them in the right, media. Right. I mean, right now, Jada Pinkett Smith is getting a huge amount of press, right? Because she's yeah. living her, her life in the way that she wants to without talking about it necessarily, but just sharing and saying, this is the way I want to be. And so it's, it's getting the press that, that it needs right now. And my wish was that it would be a little bit more informative about alopecia itself, but anytime anybody's talking about it, it, it draws attention and it's a good thing because awareness is key. Education is so important. And the more people who can be educated, the less times that we'll be walking down the street and we'll be asked if we have cancer or not, they'll um, be going, Oh, I wonder if they have alopecia. And, yes. and I think that that will be, you know, the, the shift and the change that I've and, you know, all of us are looking for it, really. Definitely. And and that sort of leads me on to that, you know, everybody, you know, you know, we've talked about this, everybody has an opinion with whatever, whatever is going on with you. Everyone has an mm-hmm. opinion on it. If you say, if you've got a cold, like that, every day I think I've got COVID-19, literally every day. And, um, <laughs> And I, and I haven't, thank goodness. But um, you know, um, you know, everyone's got a, an opinion about how you should live your life, how you should manage things. And I'm sure everyone's got opinion about how you should manage hair loss, what you should do, what tonic you should take, what you should rub on your head, oh, yeah. and stuff like that. And um, but you say it's important to find the confidence to do it your own way. You to find, you know, I guess to use the resources that are available to you, to use the community that's available to you, mm-hmm. and find your own way. It's a bit like having a kid, isn't it? Really, everyone everyone tells mm, you what to do yes. don't you but yeah with your second one you're like oh yeah no no this I'll do it my own way do you know what I mean so it's I think it's important not to get confused isn't it and then you know find your own way of of being of of, mm-hmm. sort of managing right what do you think about that, Diane? oh I totally agree with that that is I mean I even have on my website it says alopecia life and then it says doing alopecia your way and it is the most important piece of this because everybody, like you said, has an opinion. They, you know, want you to try this onion juice on your head or black seed oil, or drink this kale smoothie, or, you know, this, this can be helped. You know, my friend did this and this worked for her. Oh, I mean, there's so much right now going into things like studying the gut biome and, and that's, kind of a big deal right now in with autoimmunity in general, not just alopecia. And so a lot of people, you know, they, they do a gluten-free diet and they do a dairy-free diet and they find that their hair grows back, but that doesn't work for everybody else. I know some of the healthiest people in the world and they are still bald, right? I mean, there's, there's a guy who's, um, I think his name is Cyrus and he does the mastering diabetes and he's a type one diabetic extremely athletic and he also has Hashimoto's and he manages to keep his insulin levels to like a bare minimum eating a plant-based diet, but he's still bald, you know, he's healthy as all get out, but he still has alopecia universalis. So, Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, it, it would be nice if we could just go, okay, yes, there all are all these things, but we can spend our entire life chasing something that works or doesn't work. And the time, you know, of course you don't want to ignore things that are going on internally, right? If you have a vitamin D deficiency, if you have an iron okay. deficiency, those things can all be figured out and, and, you know, worked on for sure. But if you're going to be bald your entire life, you know, the attention and time spent on building your confidence and working on ways to thrive in who you are is probably better well spent doing that. I absolutely agree with you. I I, re- I really do, and I think um, to have peace, you you have to be confident in what you're doing, and and you almost have to come to peace with it, don't you? That you're doing mm-hmm. you're doing the best you can, and as long as you are doing the best you can, that that's okay. And I think the confidence comes from being able to talk to. Uh, for want of a better expression, people who are saying you should be doing this, should be doing that, should be doing this, should be doing that, because they may have their own reasons for saying mm-hmm. whatever they're saying to you, and it's sort of like, um, yeah, it's all sort of about you know being a whole person and and living living your life. So I, I wanted to quickly say to you about the word bold because it's sort of um, it's quite a harsh word, I think. <laughs> really, do you own it or do you avoid it? Um, or now, how do you feel about that word? I, it, it's nothing to me now, but I can't say that it always 
did represent kind of a nothingness for me because yeah. I remember even like the word wig, cause I wore a wig from the age, I guess I was maybe seven, eight. I started yes. wearing a wig up until I was in eighth grade when my hair grew back. So, um, and then I wore it again as an adult, but if somebody said the word wig, I remember cringing and feeling like yeah. I would have to respond in some way to that word, even if it wasn't even talking about me, if it was just yeah. kind of thrown yeah. out, you know? Um, and, and so the word wig was kind of a troublesome one for me and, yeah. and bald represented the same thing to me. It was something like, Oh, I don't want to talk about this. It is, it is a harsh word and it is, it's kind of seen as a negative, right? I mean, yeah. bold is let's avoid this at all costs, right? I mm-hmm. mean, the, mm-hmm. the beauty industry is like a $511 billion a industry. Lot. A lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's yeah. really focused on, on avoiding yeah. that or at least on our head and, and taking care of hair everywhere else on our body by waxing <laughs> or removing it Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's just, I was just, as, as you were talking and uh, I was just thinking about those words that, and sort of the, you know, what hair represents. It re- represents beauty. It re- represents youth. It, re- it represents, you know, as, as you said, the hair care industry is a, is a multi-billion dollar industry mm-hmm. and the way things are advertised and, um, and who advertises them, you know, it's, it's, um, it's it's very interesting isn't it really around mm-hmm. around these things so yeah and thank thank you for that um mm-hmm. i ask everybody this question um you, you we've talked about you know this is an autoimmune um disorder we've talked about your type 1 and diabetes and um so the two questions i always ask all my guests because the focus of this podcast is around health and well-being is um how do you manage to your own health and well-being while all this is going on and this is in that it's run through the whole of this podcast how you do that and and what you do about that um but also how do you stay focused positive and productive while you're doing that because it's a lot isn't it you know and it has been since you were a child so you know it'd be helpful and some tips for the listeners about how you do that how you manage everything yeah so for me the shift has come from talking about it from never talking about it no not a word about it hiding it to talking about it when when it's appropriate and not just like going out with a bullhorn you know talking about it um and and I think that that has actually built my confidence. It builds my health. It makes my mindset better when I realize that I can help others. And, and that is one of the biggest things. I mean, I feel so excited to be able to help other people who are going through this and, and helping them be in a position where I, I never could. And of course, you know, I, I walk my dog. I don't like exercise like a mad woman. I used to work out a whole bunch. Um, and, I write, I I write articles. I, you know, I'm constantly working on building the resources for other people. I have my kids, my husband, and yeah, I mean, there's just, there's a lot that goes into just kind of managing your life as, as a person. And, and right now that's, that's what it looks like for me. Amazing. That is amazing and and very inspirational as well. And, you know, so how can people get in touch with you, hear more about you? I know, you know, and we did a a course about doing courses together. So I know you're doing a course, you Mm -hmm. know, find out about your course. And um, I I know we're going to put links in about your book, but how can people get in touch with you and um, hear more about you if they want to do that? Yeah, you bet. And I can be reached on Instagram at Alopecia Life Coach. I'm on Facebook. And I know you'll have all of that in the links. And also I can be reached at alopecialife.com. I have a contact page there. I also have resources. You can purchase the book through there. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions from anybody. I know a lot of my energy has been put into educating the medical community too. And I know a lot of your listeners are coming from the medical community, nurses, diverse nurses. And I have worked really hard to try to educate because the limited amount of time, and that's when we talk about time earlier that you have with your physician and your nurse is very tiny, right? I mean, I'm not sure about in the UK, but we get maybe 
four to seven minutes. And that's if there's a scribe. Oh, wow. yeah. And so it's really, it's just so quick, right? The appointment itself is 15 minutes, but that's taking vitals and things like that. Mm. And, and there's not a lot of area to educate at those appointments, mm. but really that's where it starts, right? When we're talking about how do people find resources, they shouldn't ever be leaving a physician's appointment without some resources, without a nonprofit information, a link to a cap page or to a resource page like mine or a book title or a podcast. I mean, there are so many resources. And for me, that's kind of another piece of it, educating the medical community so that they can feel like they're empowering their patients when they leave, right? They, so that they go, oh, I've given them something, you know, they're not just, we're not just giving them a cream and having them come back in 60 days to see if it helped or not. Um, so, so I think that's, that's a big piece of it too. Fantastic. I love that. I love that. We're coming to the end of the time and it's been absolutely wonderful to talk about, to talk about this very health focused and holistically focused too. And um, I'm just going to ask if you've got one tip that you want to share um, with the audience that they can go away with and um, to help them with any anything, actually, any long term condition, because um, I think what you have said applies to a lot of um, long term conditions as well. Absolutely. I would say knowledge is power. And the more you educate yourself, the better you can be when you go into a physician's office or when you're talking to family and friends about what's going on with you and what you want from them and figure out how to ask for what you want. And that can go a long way too. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Deanne. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on this show. And uh, so thank you very, very much. And um, that is it for the Dawn Jarvis show today. If you like what you've heard, then please comment below. We really like to hear um, what you've got to say and um, like, subscribe, share, and we will see you again soon. Take care.